It's Alex Ferrelli. Welcome back to the Hand of the Day. Today's hand comes from one of my readers, Daniel, who is playing a satellite tournament. And I wanted to cover this hand because strategy in satellite, in tournaments in general, but specifically satellites, changes dramatically. Because your objective isn't necessarily to win or have the most amount of chips, but rather simply to get to the point where you earn yourself the seat. So the strategy in this hand will change a bit because of the format of the event. He goes on to tell me um, 14 seats, uh, 14 people get a seat in the event and there's four tables left. So that's important to keep in mind um, because if you have enough chips simply to fold your way into the money and make a seat, well then of course you would never even consider playing this hand or, or any other hand, even though that may be trivial, it's just important to, to realize how much different the strategy is in, uh, in, a, in a format like this. So he just gets moved to a new table, Has seems to tell me he has no reads on anybody other than the chip leader is to his right. And he just gets moved, the blinds are 1,000, 2,000, he has 50,000 in chips, 55,000 in chips, and um, the chip leader opens under the gun to 4,500. He calls immediately to the chip leader's left with ace queen. So a few things to note. Uh, one is that pre-flop calling may be considered standard, but I think that because you're playing against the chip leader and because you're not gonna know where you're really at post-flop, you're gonna find yourself in a troubled spot. I mean, you're looking to flop an ace or a queen, otherwise you really can't play your hand. And I think you have to expect that this pot is gonna be a multi-way pot because when you call, it's likely that someone else calls, especially the big blind. So you're really not gonna have much room in the hand given your stack size to play the pot effectively. You're really relying on the absolute strength of your hand to flop something. Of course, you know you're gonna miss the flop a large percentage of the time. So you're really putting in a decent amount of chips here a, to not flop something a lot of the time, but B, not to know where you're at when you do flop something. So one option for you in the hand, to play the hand differently, is you could consider three betting pre-flop. You could raise to something like 11 or 12,000, and I think that, I wouldn't tell anybody this, even though I'm making a video about it, but you could fold if he shoves, just because I don't think that without any history, the chip leader is ever gonna expect you to be bluffing here. So you're representing a really, really strong hand by re-raising pre-flop, and if you, if he does go all in on you, then you can be pretty sure that he has, has you beat. Two other callers enter the pot. So the pot is 20,000, and we see a flop of queen, seven, two, with queen, two of hearts. So he bets 8,000, you call, the other two people fold. Now the pot's 36,000, and remember, we only started the hand with 55,000, so our chip stack, um, relative to the pot, we have about, we have about, 45,000 left, 42,000 left, and the pot's 36,000. So we really have one pot size bet left, which pretty much commits us to this hand. It's really hard to get away from our hand when we only have a pot size bet left. And we flopped the best hand possible. I mean, we, we got into the situation that we were looking for by calling pre-flop. Now, the fact that that situation is a little bit sticky means that maybe we could have done something different pre-flop, which is why I discussed that previously. The turn is a seven of diamonds. So we're at queen seven to seven, and now our opponent bets 16,000. At this point, one thing that's really important to keep in mind is the size of the pot and the pot odds you're getting. You have, you know, 28,000, 25,000 behind if you just call this bet. So call, putting in any chips in this pot pretty much commits you to the hand. Uh, it's gonna be really hard to fold here. So I think in this spot, it's important to ask yourself two questions. One is, Given the range of hands you think your opponent has, you told me before, aces, kings, queens, ace, king, or a big flush draw, possibly king, queen, how does my hand compare to that, those, that range of hands? Am I ahead or behind my opponent's range? So you're, you have enough, your hand is strong enough to warrant uh, going all in on the turn. Uh, you're ahead of his possible hand range and uh, the pot odds you're getting are great enough that even if you were slightly behind, you can still justify going all in simply because the pot is so big relative to your chip stack. So going all in on the turn definitely won't be a mistake. I think that 
it's impossible your opponent is betting the turn without any equity. I think that he always is gonna have some equity against your hand. And I think that almost all of the time that he bets the turn with a flush draw, he's gonna call if you go all in because the pot is so big. So I think I would go all in on the turn instead of just call because it gives, your, it gives you a bigger chance of winning more money the times that your opponent has a worse hand than you. Um, he might not bluff the river if a non-flush card hits, or he might improve to a flush, and you're allowing him to do that for free, and then put all the money in when he has the best hand, as opposed to putting it in when he has the worst hand. Uh, so I think I would just go all in on the turn here. Pot's big enough, you have a huge hand, and I would hope for the best. Even though I don't love my spot, I have to be clear that I don't love this spot at all. Anyway, you decided to just call. He goes all in on a five of hearts. So I don't blame you for folding. I wouldn't really blame you for making a crying call either, simply because the, the equity is so close. You told me that you felt like he had you beat and you felt like folding was the right decision. And I think that even though we could run, sit here and do all this math and quantify all the numbers, there are some things that are unquantifiable and that's simply being in that situation and feeling the energy and aura of the person that's, that you're playing against. And if you get a gut instinct that tells you that most likely he has you beat, then when you're facing a really close decision, I would listen to that and that should super, not necessarily supersede all math, but it should be the driving factor in your decision, especially when your decision is a very close one, like the one you were facing here today. To recap, I think that given that you're gonna pretty much call any blank river um, and fold to a heart, I think that going all on the turn is definitely the superior play. You force your opponent to put in money when he has the worst of it, and you don't necessarily get outplayed on the river the times that you don't know what to do or a heart rolls off or you allow him to bluff you. So I think you have to protect your hand here, go all in on the turn and hope for the best. I mean, you called pre-flop with a sticky situation with a sticky hand and you flop the best thing possible. You can't really afford to let go of it the times that happens. If you are gonna let go when you flop the best thing in the world, it's better just to fold pre-flop. Otherwise, consider the option, other option I gave you, which is I know a bit unconventional, but it works because it's not exploited by other people. Even though it sounds odd to three bet preflop and fold such a strong hand like ace queen, if nobody's exploiting it, then it's not really a mistake, right? I hope that helped, Danielle, and I'll see you next time on the hand of the day. Uh, Danielle, Danielle.